A great deal of what we know about wading birds, as we British would call them, or shorebirds, as we Americans would call them, has to do with Clive Minton, who has been banding wading birds um, since, um, well, a very long Not time. Quite. And Clive and I uh, banded wading birds together 40 years ago in Britain, and we have met up for the first time in that period uh, on the Delaware Bay. So tell me, tell me about how shorebird ringing, how shorebird banding got underway. Well, it really dates back uh, to 1951 when I was uh, uh, a teenager and went up to stay with a school friend up in Northumberland in England and uh, we managed to catch a bird on the shore. Uh, we couldn't identify, we were cycling from one way to location to another when we came across this little bird running around and uh, eventually it was so tame it allowed us to drop a coat over it and catch it and we still couldn't identify it. So my friend said, well, there's Dr. Eric Enyan. He's just started Monk's House Bird Observatory a few miles down the coast. Let's take it to him. He's a uh, a wader expert. Well, that was really the critical turning point in my whole life, that bird, because he said, oh, this is a sandling, it's a juvenile sandling, it's probably just arrived here overnight from breeding grounds in Greenland, so welcome to the UK, so small boy drops a coat over the top of it. But that was the beginning, because Eric Enyan was the most marvellous person I've ever met. He had been trying to catch shorebirds for a year, uh, without much success. He suddenly realised that we as boys had a lot of experience in catching passerine birds, starlings and finches and tits and things like that with flap nets and other traps and that his knowledge of shorebirds and our knowledge of catching teamed together instantly and within a week we were catching shorebirds, the first ones ever banded in Britain. A whole range of species, roffs and dunlins and uh, uh, ring plovers and common sandpipers, even uh, uh, a green sandpiper, if I remember rightly. So that was the beginning in 1951, and we gradually developed that uh, hand-pulled clap net and a little bit of walking traps, uh, effectively. And then he was the first person to import mist nets in 1956 into England, and we started developing mist netting techniques for catching waders, uh, um, using nighttime darkness to, to make the nets invisible. Uh, but even that, all those techniques, although we got a lot of results, some very exciting results, uh, like the first sandaling we ever ringed, turned up only four weeks later, ringed in Britain, turned up on the east of the Black Sea in uh, Georgia, Russia, or eastern Turkey, or somewhere like that. No, uh, amazing recovery, but those sort of things stimulate your interest, and really, very quickly, where birds, shorebirds, with these huge migrations, go to, come from, how regularly they use the same routes and same stopover sites became a fascination to me, and the challenge of actually catching them in sufficient quantities to ring them to find out those facts became really what's been my lifetime central interest that uh, I've now been involved in for, for more than 60 <laughs> years. And we gradually scaled up the operations after mist netting. We managed to persuade in 1959 uh, Peter Scott to lend us his rocket nets that he had developed so successfully for catching geese, and we took those to the wash. Uh, with the director of the Wildfire Trust and had them for a week or two each year for the next five years and suddenly we went from catching hundreds of shorebirds in a year to 14,000 in just five years with a week or two each August or September. So we moved into a different ballpark. We designed in the mid-1960s our own cannon nets which were simpler to get ammunition for. We just used black powder and electric fuse and that design which we made in 1966 and first put into operation in mid-1967 yeah. is basically still the principal means of cannon netting waders uh, the world over. We use them in Australia, where I've lived for the last 32 years, uh, use them here on Delaware Bay, same design back in the UK, and many other places have copied that design successfully because it will propel a net, a cannon net the size of the playing area of a tennis court if you've got four of those cannons. You can use smaller nets with fewer cannons as well. And so really, gradually, by catching these birds, finally developing techniques we can catch them in worthwhile numbers, marking them originally with metal bands, and then it, from about 1990 onwards, amplifying that by putting a plastic-coloured leg flag 
which is easily seen in the field on the upper leg of a wader, as well as the metal band, that increased the rate at which we generated information by a factor of 20 times. One in 200, one in 500 was the recovery rate for a metal band being found somewhere overseas by someone found dead on the shore or shot by a hunter or caught by another band at quite a low rate. But with a 20 times higher reporting rate for someone uh, sees uh, uh, a bird uh, on the shores of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, a red knot with a flag on it, and though we don't know which individual it is, we do know that because it's got a lime green flag, it was banded up in North America. So you know a North American red knot is on its way uh, down into uh, Argentina or Brazil or wherever it may happen to be. So then the next stage was putting and that really started in a big way here in Delaware Bay about 2003. Instead of putting a plain leg flag, we put an engraved leg flag, ABC or 123, uh, engraving on it. And with a telescope, that can be read. So in effect, you can identify individual birds returning uh, year after year and you can determine where they go to and if you look around in the Arctic you can even find a few up in the Arctic so that again enormously increased the volume of data or the efficiency of these catching and banding operations to study their migration and we're seeing something like 70 or 80 percent of those birds again in subsequent years That's uh, extraordinary. so we're getting a very high sighting rate with a big dedicated teams scanning systematically these birds at various places in the flyway and especially when they return through Delaware Bay each May. May 2009 uh, is putting geolocators. Now a geolocator is the size of my little fingernail. It's one gram. It's just basically a small electronic device that has a clock in it, a data storage device and a light sensor. And what that does is when there's a major change in light intensity at dawn and at dusk each day, it records the time of that in the data storage. Now, the time of dawn and dusk is unique to a particular position on the Earth's surface. If you know the time, then you can actually say where the bird was. It's almost like having a GPS system on board, but it's done by the time of dawn and the time of dusk, and it's not use of these smaller devices which we used in Australia very successfully on turnstones last year and which we used on uh, not here and elsewhere in this flyway last year that we're now particularly trying to recapture those birds because the disadvantage of the data logger the advantages of small size the disadvantages that you don't get that information until you recapture the bird and take that device off the bird with all the stored data so, at the moment, it's a bit like a needle in a haystack. There are hundreds of knots out on the shore here. We can see the birds with a, which are carrying geolocators we put on a year ago with all this lovely stored data. And it's how we get one of those birds in front of our net and catch it to take the device off. Uh, that is the big challenge of our field work. Could you give me some idea of how many, uh, how many waders you and your, your colleagues have, uh, have ringed over, the, over a career? I've never totted it up, but it probably, if you take the groups that I've been working with, I mean, this is not birds that I personally no, I understand. have handled, but if you take birds that I've been involved in the catching, I would think it's probably in the half or three quarter of a million shorebirds, but that's over uh, you know, a 55, 60 year period, so it, it takes a long time to accumulate, but uh, yeah, that sort of water. Clive, it's been wonderful to see you again. I'm looking forward to, to going out and catching some, uh, some birds this afternoon. And thank you so much indeed. Great.